Thank you very much. Uh, obrigado pela introdução. Uh, eu vou trazer alguns filhos aqui para eles escutarem. Que maravilha, mãe deles. <laughs> Tudo mentira. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers of this event. It has been a wonderful experience to be here. You guys are doing a really wonderful job, and it's always wonderful to be back in Piracicaba. So, muito obrigado. Um, so today, um, the organizers asked me to speak about how selection can help in different aspects of understanding um, complex traits. So um, I'm going to actually kind of walk you through uh, uh, three different examples of um, exercises that we have done where we have explored long-term selection programs of different scale to help us understand the complexity of traits and, um, and a lot of work is still to be done um, in that area. So, With that, um, what I'm going to focus on is this idea of long-term selection programs. And as I mentioned, there will be three different examples related to um, some sort of determined long-term selection pro projects and other more general breeding activities. So the premise of what I like to talk about is when you look at natural variation and how selection has affected natural variation, Uh, for wild species, in this particular example, um, butterflies. Um, it, is, it has an incredible connection uh, in terms of, of the, the effect that selection can have in changing allele frequencies in populations and also in changing the architecture of the genome in general. So in, one interesting thing about the comparison of natural populations with domesticated populations or selection uh, exercises that are done in some type of, uh, some type of a structure uh, situation is that we can take advantage not only of the changes that occur in allele frequency and the overall shape of the genome, but we also have a lot of information about the demographic nature of how a, spe a specific experiment was run, how many individuals the population had, how many individuals were selected, how many cycles of selection were included in a, in a specific exercise, and that help us determine the strength of selection. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is around that idea of how we use that information to help us understand complexity. So when we think about examples of, of long-term selection, so uh, for, for those of you that, that work in um, corn, um, maize, this graph is probably very familiar. So this is the improvement in grain yield for maize in North America from the mid-1800s to, um, you know, close to today. And there are different stages in this process, but the overall idea of why I want to show you this is because this has been a long-term selection process that has been actually quite successful in its, in its course. Um, from uh, the open pollinators that were common in, in maize up until the 1930s, to the um, development of double crosses, which are crosses of hybrids. So you have four parents contributing um, uh, genetic progress in each one of these varieties, to um, the time when inbred lines of corn became uh, better, easier to deal with, and then the overall uh, uh, breeding effort became focused on what we call single hybrid. So you take two inbred lines to create a hybrid, which represents the majority of the corn grown, especially in North America. We'll say close to 99%. And then over here, this graph actually shows the, the next a, a stage of this process, which is the incorporation of biotechnology, and how each one of these steps has had an effect in, in, in improving the process of, uh, of corn improvement. Of course, not all of this is genetics, There is a substantial amount of agronomic changes that occur, the introduction of fertilizer, the introduction of better uh, agronomic practices. So the combination of all of that has really become a very good example of how powerful selection can be uh, in an agronomic setting to, to change populations and to improve them in certain ways. And um, one detail that I want to I wanna point out because it's relevant to the presentation is that for um, corn breeding in, in North America, the other, the other interesting phenomenon that has happened is because corn is a, it's a hybrid, it's grown mostly as a hybrid, um, 
It has also created this very specific uh, germoplasm structure where you have very delineated uh, heterotic groups. Typically, um, what you see here is actually a figure from a paper published in 2013 by Ed Buckler's group, specifically Cinta Romay, where she looked at um, what we, we call expire, recently expired plant variety protection inbred. So the XPVPs, as I'm going to refer to them, these are inbred lines that were commercially relevant maybe 30 years ago, 20 years ago. So uh, by law in the United States, commercial companies, they protect their inbred lines with this plant variety protection. And at the end of 20 years, companies make those inbred lines publicly available. So you can access, uh, we started in the early 2000s, we were able to actually get seed for these inbred lines that were commercially relevant in Pioneer and, and Monsanto and Syngenta, and we have access to that germplasm. And that has actually allows us to, to get a really much clearer idea of what you see in here is the connection between three of the most, uh, the biggest heterotic pools in corn breeding in the United States. So you have what we call, um, and I'm gonna talk more about this later, the stiff stock uh, nucleus. You have what is called the iodens, and then the non-stiff stocks. Actually, most of the hybrids are some type of cross between a stiff stock inbred line with a non-stiff stock inbred line. And so this creates a very interesting structure in the germplasm of maize. And all of these is due to the process of long-term selecting these varieties to combine well uh, when they create a new hybrid. Um, there are other, oh, something happened to my slide. So, um, this, is, this is too bad. Uh, so, what you, if I, um, if you can imagine over here, and I actually, if I have, here's this, the same picture, but a little bit smaller. So, this population over here, it's, it's another example of a long-term selection project that actually is happening in Wisconsin. In the 1930s, 50% of the state of Wisconsin was planted with a variety called Golden Glow. And this is how a Golden Glow plant in cycle zero looks like. We um, underwent a process of uh, now 38 cycles of selecting Golden Glow for number of years on the plant. So increasing the number of years uh, uh, that produce grain in the plant. And after about 30 years, this is the way the corn plant now looks. This is uh, a very good example of how phenotypic selection for a particular trait can have a significant influence on the, on the morphology of a plant, and therefore we expect it to also have a similar effect on its, on its genome. So back to the picture that was supposed to be here. Um, here is a blown up of that picture, and you can see the number of ears that are produced in, in each one of these uh, plants. And overall, it demonstrates an enormous amount of activation of axillary meristem that is just done through the process of selection. And it has been a very effective selection uh, protocol. As you can see here, this is just an evaluation of cycle zero to cycle 24, comparing every six cycles. And as you can see, both in terms of the number of ears per plant and in terms of the number of kernels that we can produce in a plant, it has been a tremendously successful process. So again, just kind of all the examples that we, we have of how selection can be very efficient in modeling or, or uh, changing the, the genome as it expressed in, into the phenotype. So what I'm going to talk about today is, is that idea that if you have directional selection that increases the, the frequency of a particular allele, of a favorable allele, whatever that is, that, that process of selection will produce changes in the genome. And it will produce changes because it will increase the frequency of that allele, but it also will create all kinds of weird linkage relationships between those regions that are selected and regions around it. So that combined if in a structure that is, that is formed by the process selection creates what we call, what we name selection signatures. This is not, um, New, of course, we've always known the power of selection and how that changes allele frequencies. But one of the things that we can do now that we couldn't do 10, 15 years ago is that we have access to uh, relatively cheap 
sequencing information that actually enables us to get pretty accurate descriptions of the genome um, in, 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 in relatively cheap and, and very efficient ways. So if, if we can, the premise is that this genomics modification, because they are so focused on the areas that are really related to a particular trait, are likely to give us a better um, description of what are the important regions on a genome for a particular trait. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. So, um, as I said, I'm gonna kind of describe different things that connect to these different three examples, and um, here we go. So the first example that I'm gonna talk about is the Golden Globe population that I just described, and this is the work uh, of a, a very talented individual. He was a graduate student in Wisconsin. He's now an assistant professor at the University of Göttingen, and uh, Tim was, um, a, a mathematician, and I'm saying that because, uh, you know, for those of you considering uh, different futures for you, if, you're, if there are any undergrads in the room, you never know where the next um, plan breeder will come from. He's a mathematician, similar, I think, um, probably uh, uh, Alex can relate to these, that went out to the field, he was from downtown Chicago, he went out to the field, he found out what a corn plant was on Monday, and he was working for a group by the next Monday, when he was an undergrad and then he became a grad student. So you never know where your next student will come from. So Tim, very talented individual, very interested in genomic data. He, um, he was the first one that started getting us thinking about this selection signature idea. And the reason why I should mention uh, the idea behind this particular Golden Globe population, the reason why this selection process was started, uh, the, the selection uh, population was first selected in the 1970s. And the reason for that is that when you look at a corn plant, uh, or when you look at the history of, of selection for yield in corn, if you take commercial varieties that are now uh, important in different areas of the world, and you actually plant those varieties at lower density, those corn hybrids, they tend to be very prolific. They tend to be uh, produce tillers, uh, long, uh, long branches that come from uh, underneath the ground, and the reason for that is that selection for improved yield in corn, it's, it's highly dependent on selection for productivity in higher and higher planting densities. So breeders have been working for many decades to try to increase the density of corn plants, and so what they're selecting for indirectly is for plants that have the capacity to produce at least one very good ear when hybrids are planted at very high densities. And what that is translated on, this is, this is a table that was actually put together by uh, Don Dubik, which uh, he was a, a very well-known breeder in Pioneer, and he did a lot of work to try to understand how breeding has affected different traits in corn. And he did an evaluation of hybrids that were released between 1930s in the early 1990s, the late 1990s, and he found that ears per plant is actually the trait that has the highest association with yield. Um, so um, uh, with a very high correlation, if you count the number of ears on the plant, you're gonna have a pretty, uh, pretty good idea of the overall yield on an acre, on an hectare uh, basis. So this is what prompted uh, this idea that the number of ears per plant is very connected with yield is what prompted John Longquist, uh, who was my predecessor, predecessor in Wisconsin, to start this selection for um, what we call prolificacy. Prolificacy means many ears on a plant. And the other interesting thing about prolificacy is that you can actually select for the trade before pollination happens. So if you imagine a field of corn, and this is exactly how we do the selection process, we put um, about 10,000 plants of corn in a half an acre of each specific cycle of Golden Glow, and we select the plants that have the largest numbers of ears on a plant, and those plants uh, are protected, so no pollen is used to pollinate those plants initially. We select the most prolific 1,000 plants, and then we detassel every other plant that is not selected. And then we allow, we let the pollen from those selected plants to pollinate the, the most prolific plants. So this is the definition of a biparental uh, 
by parental selection. So you have mom and dad contributing every cycle. So you have twice as much genetic gain in each generation. So a very powerful way to select for a trait and make twice as much gain. So this is how, um, oh, now this is a better picture. So we have uh, cycle zero of Golden Glow and then the example of cycle 27. The reason why this population is very useful to understand selection signatures is because, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have a lot of information about the demographic nature of this population. How many individuals are present in a population every cycle and how many individuals are selected every cycle. So using simple um, effective population size cal calculations, if we just do the math of how many generations this has been going on, the, 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 the effective population size for Golden Glow is anywhere between 667 individuals, if we just look at the progress of uh, individuals that are selected, or um, just using a relatively small number of SNPs, we calculated it to be 384. Of course, we know that the market data is biased because it, you know, we are selecting this population. So the point here is that our effective population size is anywhere between 384 and 667 individuals. So a population that maintains a relatively large effective population size, which is important when you're working on um, selection signature type ideas because you want to understand what selection is doing to a population and not random genetic drift. If effective population size are too small or if we don't have information about the demographic nature of these populations, it is difficult to separate the effect of selection from drift. So this is very useful, not only because we see a significant change in phenotype, but it's also useful because it is a population that would allow us to separate selection for drift from drift to whatever extent that is possible. And the way we do that, of course, is by simulating what would happen to allelic frequencies in these populations if we were, if we knew what is the composition of the population, which we know. So for example, if the Golden Globe population, if we had, if we selected about 200 females every year, which is about what we do, and 1,000 males after 30 cycles, uh, the yellow line over here determines the limit, the, I call the egg figure. So this yellow egg over here determines the limits of whatever uh, data point is outside of the yellow um, egg, it will be likely to be due to selection and not just random genetic drift at a 99% level. And that's how we determine what are the alleles that are likely to be uh, influenced by selection. If we had a population on the other hand where only 20 females and 50 males were selected, it becomes a lot harder to separate drift from selection because the chances that you have a substantial amount of just random drift becomes way, way larger, okay? So uh, we use this process and we determine, uh, these are, this is just one example, chromosome two, and what you see here are uh, FSTs, which are measurements of the degree by which certain alleles change in a population, comparing cycle zero to cycle 30. And what we see here is that, um, that, that uh, and I'm sorry, there is again another slide missing. Uh, so the way we did this, uh, I'm not sure what's going on. Oh. Um, this is actually important. So uh, the way we, we are doing this is by, uh, we, we bought 48 plants from cycle zero and 48 plants from cycle 30 of this population. And we sequence it uh, fairly deeply at about 50, 50 X each one of these cycles. And then we filter, uh, we did you know, basic kind of cleaning of these. Uh, so we kept positions that have 20% uh, coverage in about um, between 20 and 89% coverage. And we ended up with about a million and some SNPs, okay? So we went through this exercise of comparing cycle zero and cycle 30 and finding out what are the, the, the regions that represent, that have the highest likelihood to be responses to selection. And this is the figure that I just showed you before. And we just draw a line and said, you know, these are the most likely places where you have a significant effect of selection across the genome. 
So this is what it looks like in the entire genome. So the yellow squares, it's at a 99.9% .9 threshold. The other one is 99.99. .99. And those numbers are completely arbitrary. I told Tim we can only handle a handful of regions. So that's the number. There is absolutely no uh, mathematical or statistical reason for that. So before you ask me, that's it. Um, so taking that cutoff, we have about 28 uh, regions that were identified. Uh, anywhere between 4,000 in uh, base pairs and 9.2 um, megabases, and you know anywhere between zero and 73 annotated genes in those regions, and 22 included uh, about five genes or less. So these are fairly narrow, very delimited regions that this kind of selection and this kind of structure allows us to do. Interestingly enough, um, about 25% of these regions are in regions that actually don't have any genes. So I don't think this is news to anybody working in corn that is, you know, the, the extra genic region in corn in May seems to have a lot uh, of influence on, on a lot of things, um, and, and this is no exception. There are some particularly interesting regions that we are following up on. I'm not gonna go into the details of that, of that because I just wanted to kind of show, my, my goal for today is to kind of show you different setups where selection has allowed us to get to particular regions that are interesting in ways that are just beyond just a, a typical uh, phenotype, genotype associations. So among the things that were interesting in this data set is when we looked at the comparison, um, here are uh, three particular examples, again, in different chromosomes in the gene, uh, in the genome, and what you see here, the red line represents cycle zero, the black, um, which should be blue, uh, is cycle 30, and then this is the FST, which is the measurement of the, uh, the change in allelic frequency, and this is a situation where you have a significant decrease in the frequency in cycle 30 compared to zero. Here is a situation where you have a significant increase, and this is a, 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 a situation where you have uh, pretty much no change. And all of these, so we have about two of the 28 regions that actually fall within uh, the category of the reduction. So when you think about um, selection, the instinct is to think that selection moves allelic frequency very quickly. That you have, you're gonna see reductions in heterosis that are very rapid. And what we see even in selection uh, experiments that are very stringent is that heterosis doesn't really decrease as quickly as we, we want to think. Selection acts, but it's not a fast process. The other um, interesting thing, about 10 of them actually showed an increase, and that is also expected if you have alleles that are starting at an intermediate frequency, that you might see significant increase. And then um, there could be regions that just didn't have enough time, as I mentioned. Selection can be can be slow. There could be situations that overdominance is uh, prevalent, or there could be very likely changes in the environment that have a significant influence in all these responses. Um, the point of this slide is just to show that there are a number of things that influence selection, and selection doesn't necessarily mean fixation. There is a lot of uh, nuances in the process. The other thing that we learn out of this population which is also uh, has been confirmed in another, a number of other experiments in different species, is that the majority of, so this is the, the 28 regions that I mentioned before uh, that were show significant effect of selection. The majority of them are what we uh, define, uh, this was calculated through uh, gaming clusters. The majority of them actually produce relatively small changes in linkage equilibrium around them. And those are defined as what we call um, uh, soft sweeps. That means that these particular regions have undergone a significant amount of recombination around it. So these are not mutations that happened recently. These are, this is variation that existed in the genome for a long time, and selection has been acting upon those regions for a long time. That's what these, uh, these red dots uh, exemplify. You have two examples of what we ca call hard sweeps, these are regions where you see a substantial amount of linkage disequilibrium that occurred around those, those um, regions, indicating that select, th th there was some type of a recent change in that genome that is still, uh, that hasn't had, for whatever reason, enough time to break, um, break linkage disequilibrium. So a lot of the variability that we see 
or of the, the selection, the, the effect of selection has occurred in variability, in, in variability that existed in the genome already. Okay, so slides are really weird. I apologize. They actually look good in my computer. I know I am not sure what is going on. But so we are moving on onto the second example of the effect of selection on on a particular uh, uh, experiment, and this is uh, work done by another incredibly talented student. Joe Gage, uh, he's now a postdoc with Ed Buckler. Um, he just finished, and he, he was trying um, to combine typical genotype, phenotype association with uh, selection signatures to help increase our ability to narrow down what are regions in the genome that are important for different traits. And the trait that he uh, has worked with is uh, tassel, so the male inflorescence in the corn plant. Um, and the reason why that particular trait, so again, to the same table that I showed before, now highlighting tassels. So you remember ears were the most correlated trait with yield in maize. Tassels are the second biggest, um, in both in terms of overall size and number of branches. And uh, the, the caveat here, though, is that you're going to notice the negative sign in front of these two traits. So selecting for more ears is favorable for yield, but it apparently, in the process of selecting for highly producing hybrids, breeders have actually either directly or indirectly selected for smaller tassels. And that's where uh, the heterotic patterns that I mentioned before become uh, relevant. So just to give you a little bit of background in terms of what we know about tassel morphology, so tassels, or the male inflorescence, um, they have been the target of domestication. Uh, so the the ancestor of, of maize and some of the maize land races, the original populations, they tend to be to have really big tassels. Um, and there, there is a significant amount of literature that shows that uh, targets of domestication, they overlap with QTLs for different tassel morphologies. And so there, there's, there seems to be some relationship between decreasing the size of the tassel and domesticating corn for human use. Uh, but certainly the changes have continued way be beyond domestication. Uh, when you look at current varieties compared to older varieties, it's, it's typically to see, typical to see the reduction in the overall complexity of tassels. And a big component of that is, this is the same figure that I showed before, uh, but as I highlighted, this is the point in time where breeders started to move away from just selecting open pollinated populations to selecting uh, hybrids, and this produced a significant change in the way they thought about how to how to select these populations. So this this is a picture of a typical uh, hybrid production field today, and what you see here are maybe one, two, three rows of female, uh, the inbred female uh, parent in a hybrid, and then over here are the males. So this uh, very uh, beautiful machine is just cutting the tassels of all the female plants and leaving the tassels of the male plants intact. In, in so the pollen of these plants will pollinate these females and generate uh, the hybrid. So the reason why I show this picture is that, as you might imagine, the tassels are somewhat important for the dad, but they are not really important for the mom, okay? So this idea that we might be not wanting to have very big tassels if you are selecting for uh, female parents. And this is relevant because when you think about how hybrids are, are, are bred, that you have sort of this non stiff stock parent that tends to be typically thought as the father, and the stiff stock inbreds that are typically considered uh, the mothers, it's, it's maybe, you know, what we are trying to do is to explore this knowledge that we have about this relationship to see how this relates to tassel size and how selection might have changed things in this case. So, um, the, re the, the, the experiments to give a definite answer to the question of whether tassels are directly or indirectly selected for, um, so we don't, we don't really know. There are some studies that have indicated that tassels are expensive, the plant needs to spend energy creating a tassel, and therefore selecting against producing the tassel will have physiological advantages. And so maybe that is the reason, you know, maybe that's, that's the reason why female plants might not uh, require such big tassels. 
There are other uh, bodies of literature that say, no, it's not a physiological, it's just coincidence. A certain component of the germplasm that tends to be used as a female, they just have smaller tassels because they help to minimize intercepting light. Uh, it's not a physiological necessarily, the, the cost of producing the tassel, but it's just making it more efficient so light um, is able to um, uh, get through the canopy easier. So overall, there seems to be this connection between selecting for highly producing hybrids and smaller tassels. So um, these slides are all over. But so the, the, the experiment that uh, we use to kind of evaluate these, we use two different populations. Um, so one population was a, a typical diversity panel. We have a population in Wisconsin called the Wisconsin Diversity. Um, a population that has about 942 inbred lines that represent a wide diversity of germplasm. Um, they include, uh, they, they are all adapted to the northern part of the United States, so they mature in our area, but they represent a wide di uh, array of diversity. This is a figure from a paper that we published years ago showing sort of the, uh, the genotypic uh, diversity represented. So you have stiff stalks, non-stiff stalks, tropical popcorn, sweet corn, you name it, in those 942. This po population was genotyped using um, RNA-seq. So we used um, seedlings for this experiment. So we, we actually used the entire seedling, the, the above ground and below ground. And the reason for it is nothing more than we did a, an atlas experiment. We used 60 different tissues, time, what time points and tissues and discovered that seedlings actually was the, the tissue that had the highest number of expressed genes. So we just wanted to maximize the number of genes expressed, so we used seedlings as our, our tissue. Um, each one of these individuals was uh, sequenced. We ended up with about 20 million reads per genotype, and at the end, um, we used RNA-seq in this particular case just as a mechanism for uh, reducing the genome. So for each one of these lines, we have about 890,000 SNPs derived from RNA-seq. We also have expression in non-reference genes. If you're interested, I can tell you more, but I'm not gonna talk about those today. Then we had a complementary population that um, is what we call PHW65 mini NAMs, and this is a, a population that is generated by taking a parent, this case called PHW65, and cross it by three different neighbor lines um, Missouri 44, MOG, and PHN11, these three inbred lines show very characteristic tassel types. So we tried to maximize the contrast between the parents that we use and this reference genome. So this is a mini nested association mapping. We derive um, about 200 double haploids from each one of these crosses. So we ended up with, um, with about 600 uh, individuals from these mini nests. And these were genotype used in GBS, and we had about 9,000 markers. So we have two populations, one that was designed to have very contrasting tassel morphologies, the other one that represents just a very wide array of diversity for different traits, including uh, tassel. So we, we took 749 lines from these widib, and we took about uh, 200 double couplets from each of the, the uh, by parentals, we put this in the field, a uh, randomized complete block design with two reps, we did this for three years. Um, and then um, Joe, because he just likes to do these things, he developed a whole, um, actually, uh, a tassel, image-based tassel phenotyping tool that again, I'll be happy to talk to you more about it. Um, the point in here is that you're gonna see a lot of slides that have manual measurements of tassels, so we send the crew out there with a ruler measuring height, uh, of the tassel, measuring number of traits, measuring the, the, the whole tassel length, but then the, also the spike length, and then the number of branches in a plant. And then we have a number of other traits that were measured using the software. So we also took a picture of each one of these tassels at a particular developmental stage. And then through the use of, um, of the software that he developed, we can measure all the same traits that we can measure by hand, but we also can measure things like tortuosity, so it means the angle. If you look at a corn plane sometimes in the field, the tassel is not completely erect, it's kind of floppy, and then uh, gives us also measurements of compactness, of, of the volume of the tassel. And all of these things are incredibly relevant in terms of understanding the capacity of a plant to produce pollen 
which is relevant in terms of producing NEO. So we have a combination of these manual traits and, and image-based traits that we use for these analysis. And we, um, we did this in the field, so this is just kind of the process how these tassels were measured. We had a, a large number of plata in the field. We went there, got three tassels from each plot, took them in, took a picture, and then derived all the uh, image-based analysis, and at the same time, we measured them by hand. Lucas, I wonder if you were there when we were doing that. Yes, you were, there you go. Um, you might, that might be stuck to your head forever and ever. It was uh, 22,000 tassels that were evaluated in this process, so thank you, Lucas. Um, and, and analyzed for this experiment. So a fairly, a fairly large um, effort overall. The slides don't like me again. Oh, really? Okay. Um, I'll try over time. Uh, okay, you're missing all the data now. <laughs> okay, so on the left, uh, if you can, <laughs> if you can imagine it, there would be a number of um, uh, distributions for each one of these traits that we measure, both for the the biparental populations as well as the diversity panel. Um, and the good thing is at least the highlights are here on the right, on the side, I mean. So we have a series of traits that contribute to what we call the length. Measurements of the length of the tassel, the length of the spike, sort of the overall length of the tassel. And then we have a number of uh, traits that measure what I call branchiness. And for the non-English speakers, that is not a word. I made it up, branchiness, I, I don't think it's a word, but it means sort of the volume, the capacity of the plant and the, the, archi the overall architecture. And um, you'll see in a minute why this is relevant. So overall, the PHW65 and the W, uh, the witty populations, they actually had very uh, equivalent means uh, for the majority of the traits uh, except for uh, branchiness tests, where in typ typically we have had more variation for branchiness than, than the biparental population. But overall, we have certainly had more variability. So as you might imagine, we have a wider representation of germplasm, so these populations had uh, more variation for branchiness traits. And very high heritability. Oh, there you go. Okay. Oh, see, so, yeah. So this is what it's supposed to look, and now it's even smaller. So now you definitely cannot see it. But there is a solid line and there is a dotted line uh, showing each one of them. Um, I think you might want to go back because otherwise okay. it's gonna. Okay. It, it. I mean, the idea is that you have a number of traits. Oh, I'm starting again. <laughs> no. So, so what we are trying, so we took all this data, uh, all of these branches, and, and then we run a typical GWAS analysis. And as you might imagine, we had a number of associations that occur across the genome, both for the PHW65 and uh, the WIDIF, and they were scattered all over the place um, in terms of the genome. So one of the things that we, we wanted to do, I think you can, can I do it now? Can I take over? Okay. Um, so, oh, another slide is missing. There you go. <laughs> this is entertaining. So this is the um, association analysis itself, and we ended up with about 87 steps that were associated with 12 of the 15 traits on the WIDIV, and then we had about 155 SNPs that were associated with the traits in the PH 65. So a lot of things to track. If we wanted to follow up on all these traits, it would be a very large number of regions to follow. So one of the things, that we wanted to do is to take all this information and try to figure out what are the things that are really meaningful. And that's why we went back to this election signature idea. So within the set of the WIDIV, there is actually a subset that is uh, interesting because uh, it all derives from the Iowa State stock population. I mentioned before, sort of the female side of the heteroid group. So the Iowa State stock population was developed in Iowa um, in, in the early, uh, it started in the early 40s, and we have 41 ember lines within the WIDIV set that are random lines out of the population. They underwent no selection whatsoever. And then we have 16 lines that are first cycle of selection, so they went through one cycle of selection. And then we have 21 of what we call XPVPs, which is the most selected subset within this population. So we are 
recreating within the subset this idea that how can selection signatures help us narrow down to things that are, that are important within not just uh, like we did for the Golden Globe, just looking at the genome in general, but trying to complement it with uh, the GWAS analysis that was done previously. And if the slide um, shows up, so the way we did this is instead of just looking at random at the genome, we took SNPs that were associated with the trait and then used them as a priori selection candidates to compare several selection statistics. So one of them, uh, by comparing the selected and unselected set within the sensitive stock population. So one of the statistics is the FST, which is the same one that I described for the Golden Glow study. But we also use another two measurements of, of, um, of signatures that are focused, that are uh, based on linkage disequilibrium, not just allelic frequency changes. And so we did um, genome-wide results. We scanned um, uh, windows of 10 KBs instead of looking at each individual um, SNPs. And the idea is that if selection by breeders reduce uh, tassel size, we would imagine that loci that are associated with those traits will have some type of an enrichment for these selection signatures compared to the rest of the genome. And so here's the results from that analysis. So the SNPs that you see here are pre-selected from the ones that we have already identified in the GWAS. And when you look at the, uh, the three different measurements, so the green here is the FST, and we see uh, the light uh, was supposed to be gray. If you can see it right here, there is an enrichment for higher FSTs, indicating that something happened in this subset of uh, of alleles that we identified that are actually more prevalent or there are significant changes on a subset of them. There is also, and um, imagine that you can see the gray here in the back, there is actually also a change that was demonstrated by these XPCLR. This particular uh, statistic measures alleles that change in frequency more quickly than expected and we see an excess of regions that show potential for selection sweeps. And then also, in this, using this different, different um, statistic which measures alleles that are recently arising to substantial frequency, I don't know if you can see it probably now, that there is, again, an enrichment for uh, negative values over here, which indicates that the beneficial alleles have been more recently selected. So all three of these statistics are indicating that indeed the subset of alleles that were selected through GWAS are associated with the selection that we expect uh, or the change that we expect based on selection. And the last thing that I'm going to say about these, and I will be happy to talk to you about more of the details, but like I said, I just wanted to show you sort of where we have used selection uh, for these different things is that when you look specifically to these XPEHH, you see an enrichment for more of an enrichment for negative values, which is again indicating that selection is moving alleles in the right direction for traits that describe branchiness compared to length. So it seems like a lot of the change that we see in the in the favorable direction, the smaller tassel direction, is driven by tassels that are less branch versus shorter, okay? So an, an interesting way to combine uh, the two. So um, I am going to uh, now talk on the last example, uh, which is uh, an application that was put together as part of this um, Genomes to Fields initiative. So the Genomes to Fields initiative is a um, North America focused initiative that is looking to evaluate a large number of diverse uh, varieties across many locations with the goal of utilizing the information to understand the interaction of genotypes and the environment and improve the ability to predict phenotypes in, in uh, relevant environments. So um, we have uh, for the last four years, since uh, 2014, evaluated uh, a set of about, uh, we have 500 plots in about 30 locations across the United States, which we evaluate uh, across these four years, we have evaluated about a thousand different imprint lines um, in hybrid format, 
And all of these inbreds are genotypes. So we have genotypic information for all these inbreds. We have a weather station in each of these locations that collects weather information. And then um, this information is actually generated and made public um, through our system. So here's a picture of the sites of the genomes to fields that are currently participating of the, um, of the effort. And then a number of institutions, um, many of them represented here in this room actually by the, some of the visitors. And um, so across these last four years, we have accumulated a um, hundred and some different um, environments um, where these 500 plots of data have been collected in a relatively large number of plots. What I'm going to describe to you very briefly is the, um, how we, we actually utilize this idea of selection signatures to understand the interaction of genotypes and environment. So if you imagine the phenotype of a trait, um, here a gray needle, you know, we, we know a lot about the genome, we know something about the environment, but then there is this other component that the majority of the genotypes, if you compare a high stress environment to a low stress environment, you will imagine that you know most of the genotypes, they tend to behave in a certain form, but some of them are quite atypical. And a lot of our um, limitations in terms of predicting the performance of uh, genotypes is because we still don't understand what makes this erratic uh, behavior happen. So a lot of the focus of the Genomes to Fields initiative is to try to dissect this GYE component. So one of the things that we did is um, think about GYE as a genetic trait. And the reason why we can think about GYE as a genetic trait is because if you think about it as phenotypic plasticity, right, this response of the genotype to the environment, um, the plasticity has a genetic foundation. You can select for things that are more responsive or less responsive to the environment. So there is there is some genetic control to it, to these uh, characteristics. So there is the ability to change these, I, I call it here adaptation capacity or, or this lack of plasticity or presence of it. We can go on for a long time discussing one thing or the other. But, but overall the idea is that there is a genetic foundation. So selection has to have something to do with our ability to control these. So w our hypothesis in this genome of fields is um, selection tends to change allelic frequencies in one direction, as I mentioned uh, before in the two other examples, it, um, the, for radiation that is relevant to the trait. Therefore, these regions that are undergoing uh, the change or the selection, they will explain less of the GYE variability because you're reducing if you can imagine, I'm reducing the allelic representation in certain regions that are important for hyperactivity. Therefore, you should imagine that there will also be a, a reduced uh, level of variability for those traits. So the way we did that is, this is um, work that uh, we did in collaboration with Cinta Rome, and I actually should uh, mention that uh, this work was done uh, in large part by Diego Jarkin. That's another slide that disappeared where I give credit to him. But this these, uh, figure over here sh shows the collection of the HabMap uh, set in maize. So it's a collection of 900 some inbreds in, in the maize germplasm. And we took what we determined to be the 30 least selected inbreds and the 30 more selected inbreds in this collection. And look at what are the regions that di differentiate these two sets, very much in the same way as the other two examples. And then we took those regions, there were about uh, 12,000 uh, 12, of them, and we asked the question, around the genome, how many of them have high or low FST? So what we did is we, we used this uh, model where we had regions that show high FST and low FST for the collection of hybrids that we evaluated in the genomes of fields, and then ask the question, what is the component of the environmental effect interacting with these regions of high FST, and what is the, the uh, proportion of the variation that is related to the interaction of the environment with the high uh, FST regions? These represent regions that were not selected, these represent regions that are highly selected. And the question is, 
do we do we see differences in in uh, variability? And the answer is that when you look at traits such as grain yield, you see high dif differentiation in the posterior distribution of these estimated variants. When you look at traits that are not the product of selection, you don't see as many differentiation. So there seems to be some correlation between selection and the ability of that plan to respond to the environment in those regions that are um, associated with the interaction of GBI. So this is my last slide. And um, what I'm saying here is that selection signatures are really a powerful tool to try to understand a number of uh, relationships in these complex uh, genomes, both when you're thinking about a self-contained experiment as well as breeding efforts. And now with the advent of, of uh, sequencing information, we are just beginning to understand what is the utility of it. But there is certainly a lot, of, um, a lot more that can be done with this type of approach. So with that, um, these are some of the funding agents that, uh, agencies that have supported our, wor our work. And uh, I only mentioned a few of the folks that have done this work. This is our group right after pollination season this year. The only reason why they are smiling is because they knew it was the last day. <laughs> now they smile all the time. So uh, thank you so much for your attention. And I can take questions if I have time. And it could be Portuguese too, or Spanish. Thank you.